Hi, scholars, and welcome to another great day to learn with Engaging with ELA. This is lesson two of unit one, and our topic is close reading. Today's lesson, we will look at reviewing the elements of reading closely and use guiding questions to look at details. So let me introduce myself. My name is Natalie Crowder and I serve as the English Language Arts Content Director for the Mississippi Department of Education. Before we get too far into our lesson, I want to go over some vocabulary that we're going to encounter with our text. Look along with me to our word wall. One of the words we're going to see today is the word prey. And this is an animal hunted for food. Another word is opportunistic. And that means taking advantage of a situation. We will see the word species, and that means biological classification that's belonging to the same group. We will also see this word, revered. Say it back with me, revered. Great. That means honored, adored, and respected. We will see the word indigenous. Indigenous means coming from a particular region or country. Attuned means aware or in harmony. Attributed means assigned or associated with something. And the last word, array. Say it with me, array. Great job. An array is a large group or number of something. Now that we've looked at some words that we're going to encounter, we're ready to dive in. If you didn't get a chance to join us last time, you may want to go back and look at the first lesson where we go over the elements of what it means to read closely. And we really start working with these habits and start beginning this process so that we can look at a text, whether it's a picture or a paragraph, and really get to the most understanding that we need to. Today's lesson, I put together some text on a PowerPoint for you. There's also going to be an opportunity for you to pull one of the resources. You're always welcome to pause the lesson and come back if you need to. Most importantly, I want you to be participating. Follow along with me as I read. Think out loud. Jot down notes. Your participation is everything. All right, let's get started looking at our PowerPoint. The big concept is that effective readers use questioning that guides them when they approach the text, question the text, and analyze for details. Again, if you happen to miss that first lesson, you may want to go back for some background knowledge. As I mentioned, some materials that would be helpful, some scratch paper or something to write with, and this guiding question worksheet. You can use the QR code to quickly scan, access the document, and once you pull up that site, you're going to scroll down to where it says Handouts. This is going to be a great resource, not just for today's lesson, but future work when you're dealing with analyzing text and close reading. Did you get it? And it's OK if you can't. Try and at least have some paper and something to write with. All right, starting with the approaching the text and what questions we should ask as we do this. This is the first time we're looking at something. We're just coming onto the scene. And we want to really think about, what are we trying to figure out? What is the question that we're trying to answer? What are we wanting to understand? So you definitely want to note the key information and then ask questions like, what is the title? Who is the author? What type of text is it? Let's look together at the text we'll be reading. See if you can find the title. Yep, there it is. It's a brief history of wolves in the United States. Now, what else were we trying to answer? That was right. Who is the author? Do you see Cornelia N. Hutt? Good job. 
And then lastly, what was that last question? What type of text are we looking at? Well, if it's telling me it's a history of wolves, it doesn't sound like a fairy tale or something fiction. That would make it good, nonfiction, or in this case, informational. So when we plug in our answers, it helps us start orienting to the text that we're looking at. Remember, this is the approach of the text. We're just looking for those first details that jump out at us, because we haven't even begun reading the actual text. All right, now that we're ready to move on, what was that next step? Does anyone remember? Questioning the text is what's next. So we've approached the text and we're questioning the text. What questions should we ask during this phase? At this point, we're looking to see what information or ideas are presented at the beginning of the text. Normally, the author definitely tries to give some clues in the introduction of their writing so that it can help the reader get a bigger picture understanding of what they will be reading and learning about. So that's an important question. Another thing you'll look at is what stands out as you first examine the text. Now, if you're following along with your handout, these questions and more are listed under the section that says topic, information, and ideas. All right, now we're gonna begin reading and we're really looking to see what information and ideas are there in the beginning of the text and what stands out. Follow along with me as I read. A Brief History of Wolves in the United States. Wolves once roamed across most of North America. Over hundreds of thousands of years, they developed side by side with their prey and filled an important role in the web of life. Opportunistic hunters, wolves preyed on deer, elk, and beaver, killing and eating the young, the sick, the weak and the old, and leaving the fittest to survive and reproduce. Did you notice one of our vocabulary words? There it is in bold, opportunistic. Let's quickly refresh what that means. That's right, it means taking advantage of a situation. So in this case, they're saying that the wolves are taking advantage of the situation. Next section, I'm on line five if you're following along with me. Wolf kills provided a source of food for numerous other species, such as bears, foxes, eagles, and ravens. Wolves even contributed to forest health by keeping deer and elk populations in check, thus preventing overgrazing and soil erosion. Next paragraph, it says, not surprisingly, the cultures which inhabited North America before the time of the European exploration revered the wolf and its role in nature. Many indigenous groups relied on hunting as their major source of food and goods and were keenly attuned to their environment. The elements of the natural world, including the wolf, were important to their everyday lives and spirituality. Native Americans attributed an array of powers and miracles to wolves, from the creation of tribes to healing powers. For example, the Kwakuti of the Pacific Northwest believed that before they became men or women, they had been wolves. Arikara believed that wolf man made the Great Plains for them and the other animals. The Sioux and Cheyenne of the Great Plains and many other tribes created the wolf or credited the wolf with teaching them how to survive by hunting and by valuing family bonds. In other Native American cultures, the wolf played an important role in the spiritual and ceremonial life of the tribe. Wolves were regarded as mysterious beings with powers they could bestow upon people. The crow, for instance, believed that a wolf skin could save lives. Other Native American lore is full of stories of wolves and of wolf parts healing the sick and the morta mortally injured. 
When Europeans arrived in the New World, roughly 250,000 wolves flourished in what are now the lower 48 states. Many settlers, however, brought with them a legacy of persecution dating back centuries. Mythology, legends, and fables such as those popularized by Aesop and the Brothers Grimm intensified people's fear of wolves. In America, the killing of wolves came to symbolize the triumph of civilization over what was considered to be a wilderness wasteland. In 1630, just 10 years after the Mayflower landed at Plymouth Rock, the Massachusetts Bay Colony began offering a reward or bounty for every wolf killed. Colonists relied heavily on the deer population for food for themselves and as an export item. When the deer population dropped as a result of overhunting, wolves became a convenient scapegoat. They were also held accountable for livestock losses, even when diseases and other causes were to blame. Few people seemed to question the belief that a safe home required the elimination of all the wolves. In time, wolf killing became a profession. In the 19th century, the demand for pelts sent hundreds of hunters out to kill every wolf that they could. At the same time, ranchers moved into the Western Plains to take advantage of cheap and abundant grazing land. As domestic livestock replaced the wolf's natural prey, base of bison and deer, the threat of wolf predation on cattle led to a massive campaign to exterminate the wolf on, in the American West. Professional wolfers working for the livestock industry laid out strychnine, poisoned meat lines up to 150 miles long. When populations dropped to such low levels that wolves were difficult to find, states offered bounties with the goal of extirpating wolves altogether. Wolves were shot, poisoned, trapped, clubbed, set on fire, and inoculated with mange, a painful and often fatal skin disease caused by mites. In a 25-year period, at the turn of the century, more than 80,000 wolves were, were killed in Montana alone. Well into the 20th century, the belief that wolves posed a threat to human safety persisted despite documentation to the contrary. The killing continued. By the 1970s, only 500 to 1,000 wolves remained in the lower 48 states, occupying less than 3% of their former range. Fortunately, America's understanding of the wolf has grown in the last 20 years. As scientists have discovered more about the intricacies of nature, our knowledge of the interdependence of all living things has increased significantly. People are now more aware of the importance of predators in maintaining, health, maintaining healthy ecosystems. In addition, as our population has become increasingly urbanized and wilderness areas have been swallowed up by development, we've begun to treasure what we are losing. The wolf has become a symbol of our loss. The overwhelming number of wolf advocacy groups that now thrive in the United States attest to the degree to which these predators have captured our interest and our imagination. Thanks to the efforts by the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service, zoos and wildlife advocacy groups, Wolves have slowly begun to recover in areas where they have long been absent. In recent years, wolves have been successfully reintroduced to former habitats in central Idaho, Wyoming, Montana, North Carolina, and Arizona. More than 5,000 wolves now inhabit the wild south of Canada. While many welcome this recovery, a vocal minority remains strongly opposed to the presence of any wolves in all the wild. Thank you for reading along with me. Does anyone remember what our questions were and what we were supposed to be looking for through this text? That's right. We were focusing on the beginning section. So let's put our attention back there to just the beginning. Now, when you are reading closely, it's important that you don't just read it one time. There's no way that anybody would expect you to really understand everything in such a long text with so many big words. So it's important that you chunk it. And for today's practice of using these skills and habits of close reading, we are, have approached our text 
And now we are looking at questioning our text, looking at that beginning section. So that's what we're going to focus on today. But it's always a good idea to read something through, the whole thing through, just at least one time before you go back in to look closer. So let's refocus our attention on our PowerPoint. And we're going to think about some text-specific questions. How do details in paragraphs 1 and 2 describe why early North American cultures revered the wolf and its role in nature? Now, I got that from our earlier question of looking at the beginning. So when we look back and focus just on the text specific, we want to narrow it to a section that we can manage. In this case, we're just going to look at paragraphs 1 and 2 and we're trying to figure out how it is that they were revered. What does it say about the wolf being revered and its role in nature? So we're going to need to select and analyze some details from the text. Here's our text again. Now we're just looking at these two first paragraphs. And I went ahead and highlighted some things that jumped out to me. One thing I really noticed is how it talked about them being opportunistic and that they were killing the sick, the weak, and the old. And they were leaving the fittest to survive and reproduce. That sounded like a really good thing to me. Not that they were just killing animals, but the fact that they were leaving some to survive. So they weren't killing all the animals. The wolves weren't going in and just destroying any animal it encountered. They seemed to be, even though they were opportunistic and they were taking advantage of that situation, they were also pretty purposeful in selecting the sick, the weak, and the old. The next thing that stood out to me is on line five. It says that wolf kills provided a source of food for numerous other species, such as bears, foxes, eagles, and ravens. Now remember our question is trying to answer in what way did it describe that they were revered? Thinking back to what that word means, it's that they were honored, adored, and respected. So the fact that the wolf killed something and it provided a source of food definitely was another positive or another reason that these Native Americans might revere the wolf. The other section that stood out, look there in line six where it says preventing overgrazing and social soil erosion. So because they were able to do that, it didn't cause these other problems, it prevented some possible problems such as overgrazing and when the soil starts sinking back and the land starts decreasing. Lastly, on line nine, it said that many indigenous groups relied on hunting as their major source of food and goods and were keenly attuned to their environment. So remember that indigenous means that they come from a particular region or country and that attuned means that they're aware or in harmony. So thinking about how that applies to the wolf, again, it seemed another positive detail. All right, if we pull our details together, and I've went ahead and put them here. These are exactly what I had highlighted earlier. But you really want to isolate your details when you're analyzing because you don't want to be trying to work with too much. Just like when you're reading a full text, you want to chunk it and make it manageable. So paragraph one and two, these were the clues or things that stood out to me in terms of details. The next step is to ask yourself what you think that means or shows. So when we look at the first one about the groups relied on hunting, I did some of this thinking out loud for you. But I thought it showed that these people understood how the environment worked because they relied on it for their survival. Next detail, and what do we think of that? 
the fact that the wolf kills provided a source of food. Well, leftover meat from wolf kills fed lots of other important animals. And lastly, what they selected to kill shows that they were killing the weak animals, helping others survive, and helping the soil because not too many animals were eating the grass. So we have our own observations about these details, and that's the work that we've done after approaching, questioning, and now analyzing our text. The final step is for us to be able to put it together. So again, now that we've approached, questioned, analyzed details, we can communicate our understanding. If you joined me last time, the lesson was similar, but we were looking at pictures. And instead of coming up with a sentence or a big summary, we just wrote a little caption of what we thought would go with that photo. Now in this case, we're gonna try and put it all together in a paraphrase. And a paraphrase is basically where you're putting things into your own words, but it's coming strictly from the details of the text. And it can provide a pretty good short summary or overview of what it says. So let's look together at the PowerPoint and think through what a possible paraphrase may be. When we think about those details, our question has to come back top of mind for us. So we were asking, how do details in paragraphs one and two describe why early North American cultures revered the wolf and its role in nature? Here are our observations from our details. Now we've already made sense of it and kind of put it in our own words. So what I want you to do is try and answer, complete the statement below. These North American cultures revered wolves because. I'm going to give you just a minute or so. I want you to think it, write it out if you can, say it out loud if you can. Try and put those three points in those boxes together to complete that statement. All right, I'm sure you've done some great thinking and you probably have some great answers written down. This is one option. We might say that it was because they understood how the environment worked because they needed it. So they understood the role wolves played in keeping it working through all the benefits of their hunting. So we talked about how lots of those traits were positive or good. We could use the word benefits. Great work today. I'm so glad that you decided to join us for this second lesson of engaging with ELA. The lessons came straight from Unbound Ed, courtesy of EngageNewYork.org. Thank you, UnboundEd.org and EngageNewYork.org for making these resources available. I hope to see you next time on Engaging with ELA.